This video is about the experiences of organisations which employ learning disabled or neurodivergent people in senior level or board positions. I spoke with five very different organisations. I spoke with two new NPO organisations, two larger NPO organisations, and one advocacy organisation. The first question I asked organisations was, how do you employ learning disabled and neurodivergent people? One of the organizations has a completely freelance team without any salaried positions. They pay two leaders with learning disabilities and a majority of their board has learning disabilities, including the chair and vice chair role. One organization had a co-director structure. 50% of the directors are people with learning disabilities and the majority of its staff are neurodivergent. The two larger NPO organizations paid lots of people with learning disabilities as artists. They paid some people as managers and leaders and had people with learning disabilities on their boards. The advocacy organization ran a cafe where people with learning disabilities worked as team leaders. They also had a board with a majority of people with learning disabilities. If they weren't employed at a senior level, most people with learning disabilities were employed as artists and facilitators through supported employment. This means they worked and received benefits at the same time, with a cap of 16 hours worked per week. Supported employment was rarer if people were in salaried positions. Most people with learning disabilities were employed in co-leadership roles with non-disabled colleagues. This was less true for neurodivergent staff members. People with learning disabilities were employed in governance, creative leadership and production, external training and consultancy, research and marketing roles. People shared similar experiences of navigating complex benefit situations for people with learning disabilities before they could offer them a job. One organization supported someone through a year long work capability process so they could start supported employment without losing their benefit. Another common problem was parents and other household members being nervous that any additional income would mean that the family lost their benefits. Most organizations had tried other ways of paying their near learning disabled staff if they couldn't be formally employed. Things like spending money on their training or paying them in vouchers all were committed to moving towards traditional paid employment wherever they could. After talking about how organizations employ people with learning disabilities, I asked about their approach to access needs. I asked about this in terms of how they identified access needs, what resources they used to meet them, and how they met them. Everyone I interviewed found out about people's access needs in similar ways. Every organization ran an access meeting during the induction process to discuss access needs for new staff. Everyone used access riders or working with me documents to have a list of the access needs of their employees. These were usually filled in with support. This was a difficult exercise for some people with learning disabilities. If they had been an artist with an organization for a long time, they didn't always know the support they were getting from staff. One organization tried to help with this by doing access riders with everyone in their courses, not just when they started work. Everyone said that they revisited these documents often and didn't expect people just starting to work to know exactly what they needed. People also resourced their access needs in similar ways. Most organizations were aware of access to work and had submitted some successful applications. One person said that access to work seemed much happier to fund equipment than support workers. Most organizations had an internal access budget that they could use to meet staff's access needs that weren't covered by access to work. Most organizations had a member of staff dedicated to documenting access needs, discussing with parents and carers, filling in forms and meeting with staff. Some of the larger organizations had small teams to do this. Common access needs and how they were met. The main access needs shared by staff with learning disabilities 
related to having more time to complete tasks. Organizations met this in a number of ways. Most organizations talked about making meetings more like rehearsals. This meant more structured agendas with extra time for explaining and discussing ideas. It meant encouraging neurodivergent behaviors, using focus games and creative activity. One organization had a practice of yelling snail when the meeting was moving too fast. The same organization also had a practice of starting meetings and rehearsals with I need boards. This is similar to the checking in process commonly used in meetings, but it doesn't involve speaking. Everyone has a board and dozens of phrases on Velcro, which they can use to express how they're doing and what they need. Several organizations did pre-meetings where staff could talk through the agenda ahead of time. Most pre-meetings lasted an hour and one organization ran two pre-meetings for each board meeting. Another major access need was using plain language. This means removing jargon and complicated words and sharing ideas in simple ways. Many organizations describe this as breaking down ideas or using levels of understanding. One organization talked about it for the practice of asking good questions. This meant asking shorter questions one after the other, rather than having one complicated question. Several organizations reported using easy read documents as standard in meetings and moving towards using it in policies and procedures. Interestingly the, interestingly, the advocacy organization had changed their staff handbook to an easy read version a few years ago. They found the document was simply too large for staff to read, remember, and understand. They were in the process of finding ways to adapt policy into interactive role play exercises that staff could go through. The next question I asked were about how organizations recruit and induct their neurodivergent and learning disabled staff. Most organizations did a mixture of open and closed recruitments for different roles. The open recruitment processes people talked about are fairly established best practice. Organizations prioritize clear job descriptions and adverts written in plain language or easy read formats. One organization encourages examples of skills and experiences from outside work, as many people with learning disabilities or neurodivergence do not have long work history. Organizations welcomed application in video, text, and audio formats, including as a phone call. Interview questions were to be given in advance with clear information about the venue, who would be interviewing, and what would be expected from applicants. One organization does pre-interview calls with everyone and offers informal chats in a separate space before starting an interview. One organization shared videos of the venue so people knew what to expect. There was more variation in how organizations approached closed and semi-closed recruitment practices. In one organization, anyone participating in their leadership programs could nominate themselves to be part of the board rather than needing to apply. In another organization, several roles were being recruited at once. The roles were all being filled by graduates of their leadership course. The graduates were invited to a week of taster sessions to see what the different roles would be like before formally saying they would like to be considered. The organization chose to do these taster sessions for two reasons. First, people didn't necessarily know what trustees and the other roles actually did. Secondly, some of those roles involved leading in settings where applicants had been participants or students before. It was important they understood the differences between being a participant and working on the same programs. After the taster session, interested applicants went through an interview process of a practical exercise and an interview. Next was talking about in organizations' induction processes. Most of these were standard best practices, but with more flexibility and time offered to new starters. Several organizations talked about having long observation periods. 
New starters could watch experienced colleagues over several weeks, ask questions, and think about how they would do similar tasks. One organization talked about needing to be flexible in this. Some staff only needed a few weeks of observing, others needed a few months. One organization did proportionate inductions. This meant focusing on a new starter's job role and department, rather than explaining how the whole organization worked. Sharing too much information led to people remembering less and feeling more confused about their role. 